Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and I want to kind of go back to the transit method for detecting exoplanets and have a look at something that can actually change the timing of those transits because if we have a single planet on an orbit around a star we would expect the time between each transit to be the same but that isn't always the case and actually the timing between each transit can change some of that is actually to do with the actual system itself so for example if it's got a uh, decaying orbit so it's, it's tidally decaying so it will be going on a shorter orbital period then it's going to change the time between each transit but there are all there are actually other things that can change the apparent timing and that's what we're going to have a look at in this so there is actually parallax which i've already done a video on and there is proper motion and this is to do with the movement of the star relative to us in the sky and this can actually change the time between each successive transit. So just to recap on the actual transit method, so this is when a planet passes in front of the star and it blocks out some of the light and you get this characteristic U-shape dip. And we would expect, actually, that if it's got an orbital period, which is likely going to be, it's not just a random event, then the time between each transit is going to relate to its orbital period. So if we measured one transit, we get a nice dip. We then wait, we then get a second one. That will relate to its orbital period. And then if we actually wait for a third one, we should expect that the time between all of those transits is about the same. However, as I mentioned before, that's not always the case. So here is an example where you've got the transit and then each kind of successive one is kind of below it or above it. And you can see that actually it varies about it's earlier or later than it actually should be. And again, there's a few reasons for that, but the one we're interested in for this particular video is proper motion. So what is proper motion? Well, as we look at a star, it's the it's this observed change in the apparent position of a star relative to more distant background stars, basically. So if we look at a star and it kind of moves relative to those background stars, and the reason for that is it's probably quite close to us. It's closer than those background stars, and it's got very, well, very high relative motion, actually. So its proper motion is going to be quite high. And an example of that, actually, is Bernard star. So this is a star that has kind of one of the highest proper motion of any star. It's a fairly close star actually. It's quite a close red dwarf star and it's moving just over 10 arc seconds per year. So an image here and you can see it kind of in the middle there from 1991 to 2007. It's moved quite a bit relative to those background stars. So this is our proper motion. So with regards to the transit then, it actually changed kind of the geometry of that the sort of the configuration and when we actually see it start to transit. So on the left hand side that might be how we first observed it. So the planet goes around its orbit, it just starts to transit the star, we then start our timing, it transits, goes around. But in the meantime, the star has actually moved away. Well, not away, but it's kind of moved relative to the background stars. And then the angle has, has changed. So when that planet comes back round to transit again, it will occur slightly earlier, slightly later, depending on what it's actually doing. But it means that the planet has to go around less or more than its full orbit before it starts its transit because we've changed our viewing angle. So actually it might have to go around a little bit further before it actually starts its transit because the way that we're looking at it now, it just has to go a little bit further. And that's kind of a little bit similar to like um, sidereal and synodic orbital periods. So here this relates to when you go round. So let's say, for example, um, I've got the moon here, actually, but it could relate to the um, our days on Earth. So in order for us to have the sun in the same part of the sky, we actually need to go round the sun a little bit further or ro rotate a little bit further to get it back again. And the reason for that is the Earth's gone round a little bit on its on its orbit. So in order for you to get the sun bang in the same part of the sky again, you've got to rotate a little bit further because you've also moved round, which has then changed its angle relative to the sun. So a little bit similar to that, really. You're changing how much it's actually going to be going round. So that changes the apparent timing of the actual transit itself. Now, an example, really, we can take a star that's moving around about 20 kilometers per second relative that's a relative velocity or it's proper motion and that's fairly typical for a nearby star so 
nearby stars that are kind of moving that sort of velocity really we take an exoplanet that has an orbital period of about 400 days a little bit longer than earth and at a distance of about 100 parsecs and we get a change in the timing of the transit of about 10 seconds so that just gives you an idea it's not a huge amount it is measurable, so it does need to be taken taken into account for stars that have high proper motion and things like that, which are normally going to be fairly nearby stars. If, it's, if a star's a long way off, it's not going to have a high proper motion unless it's travelling at incredible velocities. So again, these are most likely going to be fairly nearby-ish sort of stars. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, then do check out some of the other videos.